If you are a scientist, you rely on mathematics to give you consistent answers and make accurate predictions. What if it can't? What if you can give a single input two different times and get two different results out of an experiment? And can we make sure that doesn't happen? Much of classical physics models reality through what are called differential equations. That boils down to force equals mass times acceleration, acceleration is the second derivative of position, and if we know our forces and initial conditions, then we have a model for what should happen in terms of a second order initial value problem. This is used to model everything, from how a ball falls to the ground with gravity to advanced mechatronic systems. Engineers and physicists trust that they can put an initial value problem into a computer and get a good result back. And this comes down to Picard's theorem. Picard's theorem answers a basic question that you should have when you look at a new initial value problem. Does this equation have a solution? And if it does, is it the only solution? Picard says if your differential equation is given by a function that is continuous in a region around your initial point, and it is also locally Lipschitz, then you are guaranteed to have a unique solution to your differential equation stemming from those initial conditions. When we present this in an introductory differential equations course, we weaken Lipschitz and say, continuously differentiable. The proof of Picard's theorem is framed in what is called Picard iteration, which takes the boneheaded approach to solving an initial value problem by integrating both sides. We see that if we have a solution and we put it in the right hand side, it should appear on the left. That would mean that this is a fixed point of this operation. And Picard's theorem is one of the early examples of an application of the Banach fixed point theorem which we talked about in a previous video. Essentially, if we find a fixed point of this operation, then we find a solution to the initial value problem. Now, I wanna know what it looks like when there is more than one solution. Now let's look at what happens when uniqueness isn't guaranteed. It turns out to get existence, all we need is for the differential equation to be given by a continuous function. And this follows from the arzela ascoli theorem, which I'll talk about in the future. The whole Lipschitz condition and continuous differentiability bit is only for uniqueness and not for existence. So if we look at dy dt equals the square root of y and y of zero is equal to zero, we actually have two solutions. Uh, well, at least two solutions that I know of. And that happens because the square root of y is not actually differentiable at the origin. First, we can take y to be a function that is identically zero. Then the derivative of a zero function is a zero function, and the square root of a zero function is again, a zero function. So that means that this must satisfy this initial value problem. We can find a different solution with different techniques. If we leverage our knowledge of separable differential equations, we find a general solution is y of t is equal to t plus c squared divided by four. And if we incorporate the initial condition, we see that c must actually be zero. Very quickly, you can verify that the derivative of this function is indeed the same as the square root of this function, and thus, it satisfies that differential equation. Now, Picard's iteration should help us find a solution, but which one will it find? It turns out that depending on what your initial guess is, you can get two different answers. Usually, if you satisfy the condition of Picard's theorem, it doesn't matter where you start. If you keep iterating that operation over and over again, then you should converge to the solution of the differential equation. So people just typically start with the simplest function you can actually do, and that is a constant function. If we do that here, then the constant function satisfies our initial condition of y of zero equals zero. Well, that's the zero <laughs> function. If we put that into our Picard's iteration, we get zero back again, and we have thus found a fixed point right away. This is indeed a solution to our differential equation, but no matter how many times we iterate here, we aren't gonna leave and find the other solution of t squared over four. Why don't we try something that's not a constant function? Let's try an initial guess of phi naught of t is equal to t. This is much more interesting. Each operation is gonna give us a power function with different exponents and different coefficients out front. Our objective is to show that the sequence of exponents actually converges to two, and we wanna show that the sequence of coefficients converges to one quarter. So the first application of Picard's iteration takes the exponent of t, halves it through the square root, and then increases it by one through integration. This new exponent is divided in front from the anti-differentiation process and changes the coefficient. Let's be careful not to simplify the exponent or the pattern will actually be a lot harder to see. The next iteration sees the coefficient square rooted and the exponent is halved again and then increased by one. The coefficient is divided by the new exponent to give us our next coefficient. Let's look at the exponents now. We have the current exponent and then we increase by one each time. If we do this again and again, we see a pattern emerging, which should look familiar. It is the geometric series corresponding to one half. What does this sum to? The geometric series formula says that it should sum to one over one minus r. And here we have r is equal to one half. 
So this sums to two, and that matches exactly with the exponent of t squared over four. Hopefully, the coefficient should be converging to one quarter as well, and let's see if that happens. The coefficient gets square rooted each time and then divided by a partial sum of the geometric series. We can rewrite this recursively as a n is equal to the square root of a n minus one times one over one plus one half plus etc. up to one half to the nth power. And we will pick a one is equal to one over one plus one half. Let's fix some m really large so that the partial sum is practically at the limit of two. Then let's look at am plus n. The square rooting is going to continue happening to am, and that means the limit of that should go to one as n goes to infinity. And since we have a limit going to one in a product, we can really ignore that term. Then the rest should be roughly one half raised to different powers because the geometric sums should be close to two by the time we got to am. Hence, we see that this becomes about one half raised to the one plus one half plus one quarter all the way up to one half to the nth power or approximately one half squared, which is one quarter. So by applying Picard's iteration, we have found our exponents converging to two and our coefficients converging to one quarter. That's exactly the solution we already found using the techniques of separable differential equations. Let's go ahead and get started into some MATLAB. Okay, so this is one of the things that can happen. You can be zero, flat zero, all the way through zero. So we are zero as zero, and that means we satisfy the initial condition. But then later, you can just spontaneously decide that you're gonna be positive and start becoming t squared over four. Well, not t squared over four, but t shifted by wherever you start doing that. And so we can do this at any point we want. And so for instance, I could change it to say b one. Just as long as y of zero is equal to zero, we're good, we, we're allowed to do this. And so you see here, we can shift these as however we like. And in fact, we can have infinitely many solutions. So for instance, all of these things can be solutions. And that's really not a unique solution. And so here we see that we really need to make sure our dynamics satisfy Picard's theorem. Because if you don't satisfy Picard's theorem, then anything can happen. You can have a, a whole continuum of solutions to a single differential equation and initial value problem. And as far as making predictions in science, that's really a bad thing. This is a cautionary tale for those that want to use Picard iteration to solve a differential equation. You not only need to make sure that your solution exists, but that is also unique. If we go with a typical starting point for Picard's iteration here, we only get the obvious solution, which is y of t is equal to zero, and we entirely miss the other solution of y of t is equal to t squared over four. A computer wouldn't know the difference, and we wouldn't have either if we didn't find another way to solve this problem. So make sure before applying a theorem unknowingly that your problem actually fits the conditions. Even if it does satisfy the conditions of the theorem, how can you prove that Picard's iteration does actually converge? This comes down to what is called the Bonnach Fixed Point Theorem, and you can find a proof of that theorem in this video here. I hope you learned something in this video, and if you did, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. We cover all sorts of mathematics topics here, ranging from calculus and differential equations to, say, research level mathematics. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.